All right, all right, all right, everybody. Welcome to Inference Swap. I'm your host, John Pappas, with our co-host, Chris Moranis. And this is brought to you by www.inferenceswap.com. And our sponsor is Hub Bootery, Barney's Hub Bootery, 1198 North Main Street in Crown Point, Indiana. Your one-stop shop for all your shoes, for your whole family, boots for your whole family, and whatever you need over there. So stop at 1198 North Main Street in Barney's Hub Bootery. We are back, we are live, and we are ready to roll. We had a long week last week, a short week this week, but we're ready to finish off uh, uh, chapters two and, was it chapters three, two, and four. three and four of The Mystery of Christ by Robert Capon. We've been talking about this because the the one thing that this show is about is about breaking down presuppositions and inferences that we bring to the gospel or to other people because we're supposed to be discipling which is interesting. Um, it seems like we've lost the discipleship thing more and more over the last, uh, I don't know, 50 years, and the church is paying a price for it. But the reason is you have to know the good news. You have to know the gospel. And so we've chosen this book, The Mystery of Christ, to challenge us in what we think about the gospel. And so, so far, we went through chapters one and two. And if you don't remember what this book is about, there's a counseling se- session on, on the odd chapters. And then there's a group of people that challenge uh, Robert Farrar Capon, the counselor, uh, about how he counsels. And in the in this, we learn about the mystery of Christ. We learn about the good news of the gospel. So if you haven't heard chapters one and two is on episode one or something like that, then we did a break because I can't remember why. And I did a sermon and we put that out there and then we're back and we're doing uh, chapters three and four. So we've had one counseling session with Helen and now we're with Michael. And this chapter is so deep, we're going on part three of the mystery of forgiveness, which is part of the mystery of Christ. So as I introduce this to you, I'm going to have um, Chris sort of recap what we talked about a little bit last week as best as he can. It's a hard thing to do. I want to encourage you to listen to last week's podcast. But Chris, give us a little recap of where we're at today so we know where we're going to take off. Sure. So in this counseling session, uh, Robert meets with a man, Michael, uh, who's having some relationship issues. And uh, it's kind of a unique one for uh, us more from the evangelical realm. But, you know, definitely listen to the previous podcast to get a fuller explanation of that. Um, But what he's actually talking about with Michael is that, you know, this appearance of the relationship issue appears to not actually be the main problem. It actually stems from his... Uh, unwillingness to forgive the person that cheated on him. And so Robert takes this as an opportunity to kind of flesh out what happens when we don't deal with this, because this is the more important of the issues. And so he tells Michael, we're going to tackle four areas. We're going to talk about anger, which is what we did in parts one and two. And then we're going to talk about romance, which we kind of talked about more last week. Today, we're going to talk about angels and then finally gossip. Mm. And so that's where we're at today. So we're going to you know, talk about angels. And, you know, if you're already, you know, thinking, why are we talking about angels? Just just sit tight. We'll, we'll it may be we're going to talk about something that you're just not thinking about here. So, yeah. And for those who haven't had a chance to last listen to last week's episode, the, the guy that Michael was, there was a guy that Michael was in a relationship. Right, right. And what the big controversy is, is how come, in other words, the people listening in who get to talk to Robert after his counseling session, they're like, why didn't you talk to him about his homosexual acts? Mm-hmm. Because that's the root of everything. That's, that's what they're thinking. Like, that's the sin of all sins. It's the worst thing that you can possibly do. So why didn't you condemn that sin? And basically that section sort of ends up He's still in the same conversation, but he ends up that conversation about um, what the real issue is, is, as apart from homosexuality, and about what homosexuality is. And he sort of sums it up at the end where he says, therefore, the only unforgivable act, if there is such a thing, is refusing to be forgiven or to forgive, which is not so much a sin as it is a failure of faith. And so what he's saying is, 
It's not about cleaning your act up. It's not about do's or don'ts. It's about your faith in Christ mm-hmm. and your willfulness to live in that mystery. Mm-hmm. We're starting to learn about a little bit more of what this mystery is and that he's asked uh, us to live in him, dwell in him, move in him, and that we're expected to forgive because we've been forgiven. Mm-hmm. And if if it's a if we will not forgive, if we harbor that bitterness, it's sort of a sign that we really don't believe the gospel. Right. We really don't live the gospel. It becomes more of a religious thing and another act of goodness that we do as opposed to um, this thing that we're living in. And because of his forgiveness, we're invited into this awesome relationship. Yeah. Right, right. And we we talked a little bit, I think, even off air about that, too, you know, with and Robert even mentions the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. You know, where it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so he definitely points out that Jesus seems to make a really big point that this forgiveness thing is really central to worship. And even another portion of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, as you remember, John, we talked about that it says, if you go and give your sacrifice before the altar and you have hatred in your heart to your brother, or really your even your brother has a hatred in your heart to you, Like, leave your gift and go reconcile. Well, what's really funny is that in the sermon, he's 80 miles away from Jerusalem. So he's like using hyperbole to say, look, go leave your thing and walk 80 miles back and reconcile because he's trying to flesh out a point to say, this reconciliation is the greater worship than your sacrifice. That's right. And it's because you start to enter into what he's doing. Right. Right. You're Mm -hmm. living into what he is and who he is and the love that he gives and offers to the world. And it's right there before us, which is part of that mystery. So where does that leave us today? He's going to talk about angels next. And mm-hmm. and did you mention the angels, anger? You did, right? Yes. Uh-huh. And so, so let's get into this. He begins, he transfers this conversation about forgiveness mm-hmm. into a discussion about angels. You want to take it from there? Uh. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So he just wraps up with his concept of forgiveness and uh, and all that. And then he's going to transition to angels, which, um, of course, you know, the people are going to pipe up just as we would to go. What, what are you talking about? Like these little things flying around in the air or whatever, right. or, you know, just whatever. And he goes, yeah, well, we, you know, and Otto, this guy who loves science is going to perk up on this as well to say, hey, what about, you know, we can't really prove or disprove angels. And he's like, well, that's that's true because he says the only way we can prove evidence or existence is by physical evidence, not by a priori argument. So, of course, an a priori argument is an assumption up front to say, well, angels exist, therefore they exist. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, kind of right. thing. And so he's saying, no, unless you can empirically understand that these, these things exist or don't exist by your own definition – well, let, let's just move beyond that. You know, like whatever position you want to hold on that, that's fine. I'm actually talking about something different. Yes. So let's focus on that. And so if you want to, you know, pick it up from there about where he gets into this idea of angels as systems. Oh, yeah. Um, well, he does get, he, but besides that, he, he does get into the nature of man. Right. Which, yeah. is, am I right about that? He gets mm-hmm. into the nature of man where, okay, we don't believe in angels, but we believe in aliens. We, and we, we tend to have this innate thing about something outside of us while denying that thing. So whether it's angels, aliens, or something, we have this thing. But um, what what comes into play here is this idea that, if I'm, I hope I'm not skipping too far ahead, is this idea that, Whatever we, we, we tend to not believe in anything until something bad happens. Oh, and, yeah. Am I right about this? Yeah. And in the case that he talks about is like, we were really enlightened until World War II. Right. Right. We were really enlightened. We need, we had our logic, our reason, our intellect, all these right. things to rely on. But then something evil happened mm-hmm. where, I mean, as he put it, like they woke up one day, they kissed their kids. And then they went down to the local train, the concentration camp, concentration yeah, camp, the concentration and camp. loaded up a bunch of Jews into a, a train or to be placed on fire. And what happened in that time period, and this is where C.S. Lewis really came into himself in that right, time period, right, right. is they started going, how does this 
uh, normal person who has a family, who's been a good person his whole life, reason and find an intellectual uh, way to go do such an evil, right. evil thing. So then it brought us back to angels. It brought us back to right. good and evil. Good versus evil and where it comes from. And the only explanation was that is evil. Because if, if you're just rationalizing, you can't just say that's evil. Yeah. Because it's just sort of like, well, what's good for you? It's right. What's going on? What's right now? You know, my truth, your truth. Mm -hmm. What's good for you? What's good for you? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, you know... Like, you know, maybe give a real quick brief historical understanding of how they even got to that point is really this kind of, you know, kicked off with the Reformation and then really came into its fullness with the kickoff of Rene Descartes, who was the father of rationalism. And so, you know, it kicked off this series of philosophy where people started going, oh, I can begin to know things from a rational level. We don't need to rely on this purely... Uh, divine realm these things you know knowledge can be found within ourselves and david hume and others picked up on this and so what you found is in the 17 and 1800s there was this period of in america it was called you know the age of enlightenment there was this period of progressivism that the world is always up and to the right it's always moving in this positive direction toward utopia and really, it didn't take until someone like Friedrich Nietzsche, who came out and said, no, actually, if you say God is dead, here's some of the ramifications of it. And, you know, the he talks about the Superman, you know, the Ubermensch, as he calls it. Yep. And it's all yep. about that, okay, fine, if you want to say God is dead, let's leave that old, you know, silly religion behind and let's move on and become a superior race. And no one really took that to heart until Adolf Hitler. And he's the one that put, took that to literal truth. And, and you can the, see what happened out of it. That's right. And so people always believe, no, people are inherently good. They can be rational. We can be progressive. And someone like Hitler came around and they went, oh, no, this actually flies in the whole face of our last 200 years of belief. Absolutely. And this is where he's starting to get into. He's like, he has a quote here. He says, good people have always been led down into bad actions if you can convince them of some higher purpose is what you're talking about. Right, right. Would be served. And he says, we are suckers. Here's this angelic pitch. Yep. We are suckers for the angelic, demonic pitch. Taken as individuals, for example, all members of the vestry of this parish. Well, he, get, he gets into, like, we're all holy until we find something that gives us an advantage mm -hmm. or something that we'll buy into. And one of my favorite quotes from him is coming up but he basically gets into <clears throat> that um as long as we see higher purpose we're willing to go down that road but when something actually evil happens we don't know what to do with that right right we don't know what to how to live that out or how to rationalize that because it falls outside of our i guess our uh what would you call that uh materialistic worldview yeah of ration ration well i would i wouldn't yeah, I guess rationality is a materialistic. Well, well and, and really, not really, I guess. But well, I'll say, say, like historically, it's been shown that humans are inherently tribalistic as well. Like we, we are always going to try to find some unifying principle or some unifying thing that we can, you know, form around. And that's what he's like really talking about with these angels and stuff like that. Is it's it's these tribalistic modes that we can fall into, and what you find is those you know, outworkings of that tribalistic thought becomes the system. And the system is. is more important than the people themselves. Yeah, that's what we're sort of leaning into here. It's like we somebody comes up with some great, I guess, philosophy, uh -huh. uh, some some political thing, whatever it is, some kind of thing that we can buy into that gives our life some kind of meaning mm -hmm. or at the time makes sense, like, I guess, to Germany, what they were doing made sense because of Absolutely. the philosophy that they were Absolutely. perpetuated. And he sort of calls that the angel, demonic, mm -hmm. uh, what was he called that? Like the angel, demonic pitch. Yep. That's what he sort of calls it. And so he starts to go down this road where, and this is the, I don't know, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit here, but it, sure. says, it says, it seems to me the problem with the human race is not the occasional games it plays with the wrong angels, but the uh, inveterate <coughs> hankering to play 
in the angelic league at all. In other words, mm-hmm. we want to believe in something that makes us special. Correct. That makes us better than the, the other people. Yep. Now, in this time, he's using the extreme example of Nazism, or I guess that's what it's called. Right, right. As opposed to Christianity. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think he's seeing any difference other than the, you know, like, I'm not talking about killing people, but I'm talking about this thing that separates us from the rest of the world yeah 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 and he's gonna use it to a practical example at at a more local church setting but here's my favorite quote of the chapter all right you want to tell me what you think about this and i posted this on my facebook this morning okay says it strikes me Ooh, ooh, i've been hearing sirens all day it's crazy because we're now in northwest indiana it's supposed to be nine below and it's 60 degrees (laughs) And it gets pitch black at four o'clock in the afternoon, so the the, the ambulances, the everything's out. So anyway, back to this. So he says, it strikes me the problem with the human race is not the occasional games is is not the occasional games that plays with the wrong angels, but it's intervent hankering to play in the angelic league at all. And here's my favorite quote: It strikes me it is precisely the the spiritual nobility of the angelic institutions and entities to which we give power over our lives but which never lay down their lives for us, that is the deepest root of all of our troubles. Mm. What do you think about that? Oof. <laughs> yeah, I was actually... Uh, you know the... where I'm going with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Go, go for it, then. I don't want to jump in if you're, if you're rolling here. No, well, what I'm saying is, like, he uses the idea of nation states, corporations, mm-hmm. and these sovereign abstractions, like... Like romance, motherhood, and friendship, which we're going to get into romance here in a, se- uh, a second, but they're basically institutions whose interest is in people, but they themselves will never lay themselves uh, down for those people, mm-hmm. unlike Jesus. Right, right. To me, the institution of church is very much that thing. Yeah, so As somebody who's been in, involved in it. Now, I think it tries to do the best it can, but at the end of the day, it saves itself more than the people. Mm-hmm. It will, it will, um, it will sacrifice, you will make you sacrifice for it, but it never sacrifices for you. Right. right. And I've seen this, um, man, I can't even tell you how many times I know, I know hundreds of pastors that have come out of the institution just, disheveled right um about the institution itself um i i'm trying myself to have a better feel and outlook towards that institution but i do believe there's there's you know like think think of uh uh if you want to take the church out of it you think of like a uh, a corporate institution where you're laying down your life uh, mm-hmm. year after year after year after year and at the end of your 50 years they give you a, a handkerchief with your with your name embroidered on it and say thank you and shove you out the door. Right. Um, I can tell you with my mom, she gave her life to an institution. Mm-hmm. They changed all its policies two weeks before she retired. She got no money that she mm-hmm. was promised. You know what I mean? Yeah. So here's these things that we give and we buy into, we believe, we trust. Right, right. Because we think the higher philosophy, the higher theology the, uh, will make the world better, make ourselves better, or mm-hmm. something where to buy into that thing. Yep. But we realize that those things are incapable and never intended to lie, lay itself, uh, lay their lives down for you. Right, right, yeah. And that, you know, I don't have to get too deep on it, but obviously from just in today, you know, November 2021, we're, we're seeing this played out so much in the political realm. Where Absolutely. people are casting their lots on the left and the right. And what you find is that, you know, the left and the right, you know, both in a lot of ways promise that they're going to work for the people. But the thing is that, you know, those candidates and everything, you know, I think, like you said, a lot of them have the intention of wanting to help. But the institution of the party must live on. That's right. And so that thing becomes the thing rather than the thing that you actually buy into. Right. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And this is unlike Christ. I think that's what he's getting at, but but let's not go too fast. So he he says, for example, take romance. So remember, he said, like, in other words, it strikes me precisely that it is the spiritual nobility of the angelic institutions and entities which we give power over our lives that is the deepest root of our troubles. And then he he says, take, for example, romance. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about this. He says, according to the old bromade, is that the right? <laughs> bromade, infidelity is 
not necessarily the end of a marriage, but it's always the end of romance. Yeah. Right? Of a romance. Of a romance. And do you know why that is, Chris? Because it it's because a romance is much more of an of an angel than a marriage is. Mm. Marriage is practical. It's a practical arrangement between two people. Even in the marriage rite itself, the church never asked the parties if they love each other, which as somebody who's done a lot of weddings, I never noticed that. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You assume that. Let alone if they love each other with an all-consuming fervor that will last until the stars fall. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's yeah. romance. It, uh, it only asks them if they are determined to love, comfort, honor, and keep each other all of which are down-to-earth practical activities. Um, so in romance, it's precisely those high-flown spiritual claims that lovers rattle on endlessly about, not please, not please note, because their primary care is for each other as human beings, but because each one of them cares secretly and most of all for the angel of romance. Mm. So what do you think? What do you think he's getting at here? What are we talking about here? Well, I have the I've had the advantage of reading the rest of the chapter, but where we're at currently, I think, you know, to give a teaser of where I think he's going with this is that, you know, he he's given this dichotomy of marriage and romance, and marriage is this practical thing that you are giving yourself up for the other person. Right. And then romance, if you chase it. There's going to be things that occur that end that romance. And if romance becomes the all-consuming power of your marriage, it will end up destroying it because you're actually not laying yourself down for the other person. You're laying yourself down for this bigger thing called romance. And that's usually what they talk about that causes people to, you know, seek, you know, other areas outside of their marriage as well as because they're, they have this, you know, gittery, butter, you know, butterfly feeling at the beginning of the marriage and everything is great. And when that thing dies, they don't, you know, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm obviously single and not married, that instead of focusing on the practical living out daily of loving the other person, it's, oh, well, this thing that I was promised is now gone. I guess I got to go seek for it elsewhere, you know. Yeah, and it seeks what what he gets. I think what he's getting into, and I know we both have read this, but what he's getting into is that this idea that we've already talked about: romance asks something from you, yep. and it asks something from somebody else. And if we hold that above that somebody else, it's ultimately a love affair with death. He basically mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. because in its purity, it's always uh, the dying of love. It's always you're. you're you're trying to get this person into this idea of romance, which has now become your idea of love. Right, Instead right. of loving what's right there in front of you and the situation that you're in and the circumstances you're in, you hold them to some concept that isn't, it's an abstract uh, reality yeah, yeah. and not reality itself. And, and I, I love the idea of what you said with the politics right now. There's a lot of these abstract ideas of who's a man, who's a woman, you know, all this abstract idea over BLM and CRT, all these things of, you know, what defines us as um, gender and all this kind of stuff. There's all these abstract things out there and we're not looking into reality and saying, hey, if I look down, I realize that I have a twigs and berries, <laughs> And therefore, I am, the, you know, we're not living these things out in reality. We're trying to play out the concepts and perpetuate concepts on people who are living in real lives in reality. And this is how it starts. This is how we start. Um, well, we can use and go back to Nazism. What happens is those ideas become more important than the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. And they ask you to die for those things rather yeah. than for the person in front of you. So you're really you're willing to sacrifice to the angel god uh, romance for romance or sacrifice to the angel god for CRT or for the gender god. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? But and you'll 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 give up half the country's lives <laughs> but you won't love what's right in front of you. And I think this is the heart of the issue of that's what of what he's going through. Yeah. All right. So this is what he's talking about when it comes back to this idea of uh, 
those things can't really liberate us. But then he comes back to reality uh, when he starts talking about the mystery of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he says, all of us, all of us, I'm sorry, all of which brings us back to the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ, of the incarnation of God in merely human flesh, flesh, when the when the God revealed in Christ redeems and reconciles the world, he does something totally unromantic. You wanna you wanna see what he's saying there? What do you think he's saying there? Uh well I think we're gonna definitely get into it here more practically. Uh but yeah, he, he's not going to he's he's going to do what we just talked about earlier in marriage is that he's going to give give away his life and lay it down for the person instead of following, you know, some systemic ideal. There it is. And I, I, I actually love the way he sort of frames this whole argument. It took me a minute to figure out what's going on. Like it did the crowd. Uh huh. Like he's like, what does angels have to do with the mystery of Christ? But he's getting away from the notion of these conceptual ideas we bring to people mm -hmm. and how Jesus, we don't learn anything through the incarnation. It's like, like what is the Lord's prayer that he came to us, but we spend our whole time here on earth trying to get to him. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And he brings the kingdom. Yeah. We seek the kingdom. Yeah, we, we think yeah. we're bringing kingdom when the kingdom has been here the whole time. And mm. this is part of the good news, right? Which gets into the mystery of Christ. But he, he gets into this idea where, this is totally unromantic. It's so unromantic. It happened in real time, yep. in real history. And he, get, he he quotes Hebrews 2, 16 through 17, where he mm -hmm. says, For it is clear that Jesus did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had become like us. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the, the, the whole point of it. He became like us. He became a high priest for us to make one sacrifice for all time, for all people right. in real time. So that we wouldn't look for philosophies, concepts, these things that mm -hmm. uh, we think will make us better, but learn how to love and and uh, come in relationship with the people around us. Now, tell me, that's a good discipleship point. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. You really can't start in discipleship until you really understand. This is why I'm like people don't understand the depth of the gospel. And I think this is why he's such a profound author. They don't understand the depth of what Christ did, and so that we could not only be in relationship with him, but with each other. Right. Because we really can't. So he goes on to say, do you see what it means? You want to take it from there? Right after that scripture. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so we'll just kind of read and we'll, you know, yeah. maybe back off of it. So, so what he quotes here is he's saying, what does this all mean? It means that God's action in the world takes place primarily in plain, old, messed up human nature. He does not kill off sinners. Rather, he himself dies totally a human death in order that they may live new and fully human lives in the power of his resurrection. So accordingly, romance, capital R romance, is not just a perfectionist, life-denying activity that leads sinners the only available candidates for the role of lovers to beat up on each other. It's, you know, basically he's saying it's this that I'm doing is not to set up this new tribal war that like, what is this? It's also a religion in its own right and a purely spiritual religion at that one that stands in flat contradiction to the gospel of the incarnation because the incarnation says that God cares more about having us in relationship with him than he does about the purity of his love. It says that he's in love with us, not a romantic love for us. And it produces not a religion that will sooner or later cut off all its adherents, but the outrageously good news that God will give up anything he has just so he can have us. Wow. Come on, man. <laughs> How amazing is that? I've never heard it explained. I, listen, I've taken theology, apologetics, theology, yeah. systematic theology. I've gone to Bible school. I've gone through missions training, mm -hmm. a thousand sermons. I've been to a thousand conferences. Not one time I've ever heard anything like that. Right. Would you agree? That is profound, man. Yeah, it, it definitely. It sets up a, you know, we have this ideal of what you know of who God is and what he's done and and we just forget about 
like the fact that Jesus is fully human and what he's done is take on a fully human existence. Like we want to, we want to leave that out and we want <clears throat> to elevate, you know, the, the glory and holiness of God. And we forget that, no, he actually, like Philippians 2, you know, I quote this all the time, Philippians 2, yeah. he who did not count equality with God something to hold on to or use to his advantage, he gave that up. He gave that up so he could be with us because right. only by becoming us could he reconcile us. And I love how he starts going into the Old Testament here. <clears throat> oh, yeah. He transitions yeah. from this thought, which is, this was the definition of good news. Yeah, yeah. This is the definition. And then he goes, it's not like this wasn't in the Old Testament. Right. And and the old argument is there's like two different gods. Yeah. There's the god of... Uh, yeah. The one that hates everybody and like yeah. like judges them and kills them, yeah. and then there's Jesus in the New Testament. Right. But that's he argues against that. He says, take the law of the Old Testament, for instance. Everyone talks about it as it's some third person standing outside, uh, or uh, of or in between God and us, as if we and God are looking at each other not in relationship of care, but over both sh- shoulders as a prosecutor called the commandments who tell God to hate us and us to fear God. Right. Wow. But if you actually read the Old Testament, what is it about? And I'm going to I'm going to turn this to you cuz I know this is a passion of yours. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for this sure. This is a passion. I know this is how you look at the Old Testament. Absolutely. And I know um <clears throat> there's many of us who don't, aren't familiar that I I've met many old uh or new uh, should I say new Christians, new New people that are coming to the Lord, the one of their holdbacks was this idea of this God of the Old Testament. Right, right. So what do you got to say about that? Yeah, I know like when I first, you know, when I first became a Christian, I was actually so scared to read the, you know, so scared to read the Old Testament. And that, and that's just because I had this vision of this, you know, nice, loving, meek, calm Jesus. And then the Old Testament was, was nothing but... You know, the God was this angry man and the kid with the sky with a magnifying glass trying to, you know, <laughs> trying to kill yeah. us all ants down here. Of course. And, you know, and I am so and truly I'm so happy that Robert Capon takes the stance that he does because we can set up this terrible dichotomy that the Old Testament is this horrible, wicked thing. And Jesus comes on the scene going, hey, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of all of that. This is, was a terrible idea. I'm scratching all of it and starting over. Right. No, what does he say? You know, I'm fulfilling. I'm it. fulfilling. Not a dot, not an iota, not even the smallest flick of the brush of a Hebrew letter will be moved. Absolutely. Will be removed. And he's saying this, he's not, you know, when he comes on and says, I've come to fulfill it, he's not saying I'm abolishing it. He's saying I'm actually fully representing what you guys received. And so when, you know, you look at Genesis, I even think it comes back to the beginning of Genesis that we are taught mostly that the beginning, what, you know, that we hear that the story is about heaven and hell and it's not, it's about heaven and earth and how God went to be with his people that he said were amazingly good. Right. And that's what it starts out with. And then, and what we found is that through our own stupidity, we have now distanced ourselves from him, but he never distanced himself from us. And he goes out of these horrible pains to always be with us. And he sets up this thing called a covenant, Uh. which he's saying, no, we're not going to, you know, a covenant is even stronger than like our American contractual agreement of marriage. It's basically God is saying in Genesis 15, like set these animals, cut them in half, and he's saying, "I'm gonna actually pass through them, right? Because you will fail to keep up your end of it, but I will, br- you know, I will bear the brunt of your failure because I must have you. You are my creation, and you are so dearly loved." Now, there's a friend of ours that's <laughs> part of our missional community, or whatever you want to call that. We do one church, mm-hmm. and one of his hangups was, and I love he uses it in this, mm-hmm. and. He was like, you know, how can I love a God that brings a flood? Oh, sure. To kill all these people and commands it. Mm -hmm. And how do you love a God like that? Yeah. And what we forget is that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. That's not even the truth of the story. The the reality of he was like all he saw was a God that is full of anger. Yep. Is full of judgment and kills people for no reason. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, like God's up there like, well, you know, I have nothing to do today and they've sinned a lot, so let's just kill them all. And they forget the end of the story, which is the re- renewal of covenant. Right. Which is the rainbow. Right. That, that God has the right to judge because he's God. Mm-hmm. But instead of uh, uh, making that his final judgment, it's really about will we get in the ark? Will we walk into this relationship? Will we see the rainbow for what it is? Yep. You know what I'm saying? And so we find that it's really the story is really about a renewal of covenant, right? Not right. so much uh, the the wrath of judgment, right? Right. And, and what you find out in the New Testament, I think, if when you read parables, is Jesus always in every parable, in every single parable. And trust me when I'm telling you this. There's a lot of denominations that do not know what I'm about to say. He always starts with inclusion. We could talk about, and what I'm telling you is he starts with love. He starts with the acceptance of everyone. If we want to take it uh, and, and zone into the the, uh, the prodigal son, which is one of your favorite right. uh, sure. parables that we've talked about many times, it's this idea that you know this this prodigal son decides that he wants to, he has this whole plan of how to come back to his father. Right, right. And I'm going to let you jump in here because I know you got a passion for this. So I'm going to let them feel your passion. Sure. But but what is, how does God, how does the father accept this guy? And, and how does his plan roll out there, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, how do I boil this down? Because I could talk about this for hours. Um so <clears throat> if you ever want to get a really good sense about the prodigal son, I can recommend no one better than the scholar Kenneth Bailey. He has just really opened my eyes to understand what this parable is really talking about in Luke 15. Um, so just a real quick synopsis, because almost all of us know this parable, even if you're not in church, you know, never been to church in your life. Most people know about the prodigal son or have a basic understanding of it. So, of course, you know, the younger son wants his inheritance. The father splits it up amazingly that he even do that. But he gives the son his inheritance and he goes off to a distant land and he squanders it through riotous living, whatever that means. He's just really terrible with his money partying up or whatever. And he gets to the point where there's a famine in the land and he's just down on his luck and he's got nowhere else to go. And he remembers how good his father's servants had it. And so he conjures up this idea in his mind that he says... If I can go to my father and say, I've sinned against heaven and before you, which is basically like this idea of my heaven, my sins stack as high up to the heavens. I can't, you know, I can't do it. That's right. And he says, I've sinned against heaven before you. Make me, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. However, make me like one of your hired servants. And we've talked about this before. That phrase hired servant is the Greek word mystios, which he could have used doulos, a slave, or he could have used something else. Mystios is a hired laborer, which what he's getting at is saying, hey, dad, I need job training. I need to get paid because I got to pay you back for all the money I stole from you. And then maybe after the end of that, will be reconciled, will at least be even. And so he's got this idea in his mind of what he's going to do, and he sets off before, and it says that the father is looking. He is literally, he's not sitting on the recliner, waiting back, tapping on a shoe, waiting for his son to come home because he right. knows he's going to fail. It says that he's yearning, he's looking through. And the one thing I've told you before that's really helped me is that the, he's not looking at some open pasture. He's literally in the marketplace, you know, like there's just... You know, this giant city, you know, think of like a ghetto, how tight it's packed upon each other. And people are out doing trades. Everyone is looking at stuff. And what does the father do when he sees his son on the outside is he's filled with compassion. Right. And he runs to him. And we all know, you know, that running, you know, in that patriarchal culture was very bad on him. But what it's trying to represent as the father says, I love my son so much. I'm going to take on the disgrace of the whole town so that I can be reconciled to him. Mm. And if you think about the picture, I think it's Michelangelo or Rembrandt, you know, the famous Rembrandt painting of the son clinging on to the father and his father embracing him. It's actually backwards. The father falls upon the son and says, you know, just pleads with him. And out of that love, the son responds, I I got nothing. And, you know, the father's like, that's all I wanted. And the beauty is his whole plan. Right. The son's whole plan. Yeah, it's gone. It's wrecked. Like, in the encounter of this amazing love with the father, the son can't follow through with this plan. 
And so what does the father do? S- looks at his servant and says, get the best robe, which is my robe, which I use for weddings and feasts. Right. Get my robe, get the sandals, because he's no longer a slave. Get the ring, he's in the family. And he restores him to his sonship. As if that initial conversation of, dad, you're dead to me, give your me your money, had never happened. There it is. And this is the kind of reconciling covenant God we have who right. is more interested... You know, I often wonder, well, he's more, in, let me finish that thought. He's more interested in relationship, in that covenant, than how he looks. Absolutely. You know I mean? I, I, there was one of the best sermons I ever heard by Tommy Tenney. And the dude spoke for four hours, no joke. That's a long sermon. That's a lot. And so it's a, and you know me, that's surprising I learned anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he said something I'll never forget. He goes, isn't it amazing? how the name of Christ is upheld after all these years of bad preaching. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And what me and you are trying to do is bring some truth back to this gospel where we have seemed to get off into our own angelic concepts yep, yep. about what it means to be a Christian, who is a Christian and who's not a Christian, yeah. and what Jesus has done and who's allowed to be in this thing. Now... No no Christian I know will go, well, of course everybody's in. Jesus died for the world. Until you start defining, well, what if he's like this prodigal son? Yeah. Then, well, you do have to go to church. You do have to say so many prayers. You do have to do mm. five Hail Marys. Sure. You do have to do this. And we start just sort of adding to this gospel and we... It, it just loses the good news. It becomes more about achi- achievement, a performance. You right, know what I'm right. Yep. Yeah. And so, as we conclude, I think we're getting to the end here. Getting close. Yeah. yeah. Um, he talks about how he says, "I want you to think of the mystery of God's incarnation, incarnation in this world, in terms of what the director of a piece of improvisational street theater does when he attempts to make a coherent pr- play." Out of a random and often senseless actions, his cast may offer him. Right, right. And so he's he's transitioning out of this idea of uh, angelic conceptual Jesus. Right, right. And what we think that is, and there's a lot of denominations that think these things, into this is what he really did. Yeah. He he came like a street theater where he doesn't know. Who's doing what and Correct. what time they're going to do it. And he's not directing it. He seems to come in and in, 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 into the randomness of it all. And he says, first of all, like such a director, the divine directing mystery does not stand outside of the action of history holding a script and telling everyone to stick it. Right. <laughs> or, stick, or stick to stick it. Stick yeah. to it. I'm sorry. Instead, the word of God incarnate, God himself, enters the play of history in person not as an interfering angel with his own agenda, but as a human being among human beings. Right. And so what does that tell us about God? What What is he saying to us about God? Yeah, he's, you know, you've talked about this, you know, many times that he, he's in the muck of it. He, you know, he, he he's, you know, he, you know, just almost indistinguishable at times from the rest of us. Um, but he's there, you know, in the muck of it, building relationships with people and showing people the kingdom and what it really yeah, looks like. I mean, ask, you know, we all know the gospel, at least most of us do. Like, what? where is it that Jesus forces his opinion upon you, upon you and makes you say what he wants? Yeah. Where is it that he calls you to do the action that he commanded you to do right now? You know what I mean? Peter's Peter. Right. Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus. Right. The adulterous woman is the adulterous woman. Yeah. Uh, Judas is Judas. They're free. They're free to live this thing out, and he's living among them. And he, he's not coercing them. He's not uh, making them do it, uh, everything that he wants. They're all free to do as they will. Right. With Within his free will that he's offered. They don't even realize that, you know, the the myth of individuality, right? Right, that right, right. He's literally holding this existence together 
but he he doesn't come in like that. And and what's weird about the dichotomy of that, if we can pause, is, you know, when you're talking to people, they're like, well, why doesn't just Jesus show us this or do, why doesn't oh, he just like yeah. why doesn't he just come here and do it or why doesn't he why does he let bad things happen correct but then he comes into the mist and literally takes on all of it yeah that, that, that doesn't count <laughs> yeah you know what i mean that just doesn't count anymore and so he's it says but that ending will not dictate by a plausible or pushy interventions on his part rather he will achieve what he's going to do out of the cast of actions by a combination of paradox, hands-off body English, and when necessary, the sequestering of all possible unhappiness in the play himself. Right. So this is how he's doing things. Left-handed yeah. power is basically what he's saying. Yep, there. yep. Second, therefore he enters the play as it is, and he enters it in a way that is unrecognizable as the actions of a respectable directing God. On the evidence of the actual history of the play, in fact, he is indistinguishable from the characters of the play. Right. Why do you think that is, Chris? Well, I think a lot of it, you know, goes back to what they were what they were looking for as well. They were looking for this kingly triumph and everything, but I think, you know, a lot of it too is that you know, again, you know, like with Philippians 2, that he came in the likeness of man so that he can know who we are. It's not, like you said, it's not this hands-off puppeteering as if he's putting these actions into play, you know, setting up the dominoes and then he's going to push it and then sit back and watch the thing unfold. No, he's actually entering into the muck of it so that he, I think a lot of times, you know, I'm, I, you know, this is kind of my own personal thing. I think it's so that he can even further relate to us and the people he's dying for. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was just watching this Netflix thing called Invictum. And it, I think we talked about it, but it's, it's that chick, Allison, is it McCamey from Smallville? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she gets involved in this cult. Mm -hmm. But why does she get involved? She, here's this girl on top of the world, has the best job in the world, getting everything the world has to offer. Yet deep in her soul, she's not satisfied. So she gets involved in this cult. And there it is. The the angelic concept that is that seems good, but in the cult... Right, it seems good. It seems like it's going to change the world. People right. buy into it because it's going to be the better you of now. Right, right. All this kind of stuff, and then it ends up to be a sex cult, right? And very disappointing, and yeah. you know, blah blah blah. But this is also one of the reasons Jesus gets his hands dirty and comes as just one of us, right, to do the thing that he's going to do. And and the reason I say that is. Because this is the second point of what he's getting. He says, therefore, as he enters the place as it is, he enters in a way that's unrecognizable with one notable exception, which is that he stands at all times against the other character's preoccup preoccupation with religion, mm -hmm. with the angelic, with the conceptual, with the right. philosophical, with these things that are not grounded in the things that are right now. And the reason for this is, it's precisely their religions and their religiosity that keeps their actions from reaching the happy ending, a happy ending, mm -hmm. which would never be the happy ending that we would pick. It's their bondage to angelic notions and their worship of false gods that prevent any truly human successes from coming off. And if you think for a moment about the refusal on the part of the director to have any truck with religion, you will see that it's one of the hallmarks of Jesus' actions. Right. What do you think of that? Yep. I got to tell you, man, I'm in the pastoral world. They hate it. They, You say that, man, you're starting to fight. Why is that? Uh, because we need to feel like what we're doing matters. We need to feel like we're called... And, you know, I think we've had this discussion, like, I used to think calling was this great word. And I do recognize that God uses people. Mm -hmm. But this idea that calling the way man has defined it means that God really couldn't do it without Paul. God couldn't do it without Peter. Mm. God couldn't do it without the disciples who became apostles, who became disciple makers. Mm -hmm. It's it, And that's, we forget that this whole thing, 
up to the cross. He did without anybody. All we did is participate in the sin in our own free will against him. And and it's it's we want to feel special. Mm. We want to feel called. We want to feel like our word matters. We don't, you know, like we, we pedestal pastors. We pedestal authority figures. We have pedestal hierarchy. We, we pedestal spirituality because we want to believe they have something we don't and that we can achieve that thing. And it goes back to the performance thing. There's nothing about it that has to do with faith in believing in the abilities that God has given us and the gifts of the church that he's given us. Uh, apex gifts we don't search those things out or we search them out in the most spiritual way but not in the most practical ways mm-hmm. right like what is an impossible a practically rather than just all spiritually what is a prophet practically mm-hmm. rather than just the spiritual thing what is this evangelist practically rather than this guy that goes to church to church to get goes to god's church Mm. And preaches a sermon to get the people saved, saved. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I never understood. I mean, and so we, we would like to remove ourselves from the practical environments that we're in in order to live out some conceptual thing that we place on others and sort of map, measure, and manage our lives uh, in comparison to others. And so Jesus comes by and he, he, he says one of the hallmarks of Jesus' action is he kicks the ladder out of religion. Mm. And boy... That means we're just like everybody else. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> You're just like everybody else. So he goes on to say, who in fact did spend most of his time uh, inveighing against sinners? No, he accused. He was accused of being too friendly with sinners. Oh yeah. Too friendly. He's a yeah a drunkard and a gut a glutton, <laughs> a, glutton, a yeah. wine bibber, a blasphemer. Yeah. Those he really socked it to were who. Yeah, the religious elite, yeah. So what do you think, uh, so Louise jumps in. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think we can, yeah, I, I think we could definitely, you know, boil this down, because I'm sure we don't want to go on a part four, five, and six. No, we're, we're, we, we could definitely talk about this forever, but, yeah, so Louise. So, so let's get into right here, because we've got ten minutes, and we're closing it down. Okay. So why is he talking about religion? Yeah, because it, it's the thing that we personally want to crave the most that's going to quote unquote lead us to salvation but it's the thing that ultimately will always lead us to death and so jesus is the great revealer to show no that will lead to death you know follow me and there's life right you know and it's like it's going back to what does this have to do with the angelic thing that he's talking about well because we'll always end up um you know uh platforming and uh lifting up you know these things which will end up, you know, like you said, you know, thinking that that's going to be the savior of us. We're going to lift it up. And it, like you said earlier, it requires so much sacrifice on our part. But what you find out is it's, you know, gives nothing in return. And it's like, what it's, I, I can't remember who said this. You know, I heard that, you know, idols by nature are something that ask us to sacrifice a little up front for a great return, but end up asking us to sacrifice everything in a return of nothing. Ooh. Well, he goes on to say, and I just thought I'd throw this out there. He says, Christianity is not a religion. The sort of thing that can only lead to, that sort of thing can only lead to confusion. Christianity is the proclamation of the end of religion, not of a new religion or even the best of all possible religions. And therefore, if the cross is the sign of anything, it's the sign that God has gone out of the religion business and solved all the world's problem without requiring any single human person to do any single religious thing what the cross actually is a sign of is the fact that religion can't do a thing about the world's problems that it never did work and it never will which is exactly what hebrews 10 4 says for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins so if you want to theologize theologize What's that word? <laughs> Theolo- Theolo- I can't even say it. Theologize? Theolo- <laughs> Theolo- yeah, Theologize. Theologize. Sorry, Theologize. man. I'm like, Theologize. nice to meet you. Like, so if you want to theolo- theologize it into a sign, the best you can do is say is this a sign of, it's a sign of the fulfillment of all that religion ever tried to do and could not. Yeah. If that's hard for you to grasp, 
it's just hard for you to grasp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do like, because, you know, in the, in the context of what he's talking about there is where Le- Luis pushes back and says, hey, you know, didn't Jesus actually do something religious when he died on the cross? And, you know, and this is where he says no and goes on to what you just talked about. But what I love, though, is where he says, hey, let's just use a thought experiment here. Let's say Jesus wasn't in the first century. Let's say he came on the scene in what he says, 1959, and he was condemned to death in 1992. Well, back then they did execution through crosses. Today, you know, I mean, in 1992, they did it through the electric chair. So he says that if Jesus came on the scene and, you know, died in 1992, he would have been hung up on a cross as if that's some grand religious symbol. It was the, me- you know, it was the means of his execution. He said, no, he would have died on the electric chair instead of people wearing crosses around their necklace. That's right. They would have had electric chairs on their necklaces and they would have been singing the old hymn of the old rugged electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So why is he going into that? It's because that even, even something like the cross, which is the means of Christ's execution, which of course turned out to be his grand, grand enthronement, but people, what they can end up doing is they can end up religi- religizing, however you want to say that, yeah. the cross itself, and that the cross itself as a symbol becomes greater than the person who was actually on the cross. And so we get back into this concept of angelic uh, right. thinking. And it, we're special. We buy into this thing. And it's wow. us and them. Now, this is where he turns into the mystery of Christ. And this is where I want to get. He says that kind of thinking takes a transactional approach mm. mm-hmm. to this thing we call Christianity. Belief in Christ. And... Let me say this because we only have like four minutes left. Basically, what he says is we start believing that the church is the pipe, the church as the institution, the church as the structure, as the hierarchy, is this thing that God put on the earth that he will work through and he will funnel all things through from the church out into the world of how he's doing something. And that is a clear biblical, scriptural even by the incarnation itself, just a, a, a heresy. Well, and that's what sparked the whole Reformation. Is it? What if that's just part of it? What do you what, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm just saying, like where he's talking about. I can see it in your eyes, like oh god. <laughs> but like, what, what do you? Let's hear what. Well, you what, I'm, what I'm talking about is in the Reformation. The response to it was that the Catholic Church had become corrupt and basically said, "Hey, you got to buy your way into a relationship with God through these means." You know, you know, it could be. Um, I think it was through what was it? Um, what was the thing called where they would purchase? Uh, jewels and stuff which would help people get through purgatory and all these different things and so it actually turned into what he calls here i love the analogy of it is that you took what the church was supposed to be the light of the world but wait uh, before you get into that let's not let the lutheranism or the evangelicals off because what they turned it turned christianity was into rather this thing about being a love and relationship they turned it into a proposition Mm mm-hmm and that's sort of my kickback against evangelicalism, especially fundamentalism. Right, my right. God, like, just shoot me in the head with fundamentalism. But they turn it into a proposition rather than a relationship that has good and bad in it. In mm-hmm. other words, Jesus is all the good, but he's he understands the relationship that he's in. Yeah. He understood the world that he came to. Mm-hmm. He didn't have angelic notions. He knew his relationship with God and with God towards the world and the world's relationship towards God. And he became that, uh, I hate to use the word bridge because that has evangelical <laughs> yeah, terms to it. Yeah, that, yeah. I hate to use that word, but he became the thing that, that um, allowed, invited everyone into this relationship. Because I'm not going to use that word bridge. But anyway, okay. um, so what we get is, no matter what spin we put on it denominationally, and we know that the ecclesiastical history of the church, what we find is Jesus did something completely outside of that. And in that reconciling work, uh, he gets his hands dirty. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, he gets them so dirty that he gets them bloody. Right, right. He raises from the dead. And 
what I love is the the uh, analogy, if you will, that Capen puts it in. He's like, try to get out of the sun hmm. when it's when it's July fourth on that Sunday, or on that on that summer day. Okay. Try to get out of the sun. This is what God's grace, what the mystery mm. of Christ is like. You can't get out of it. Mm. Unless you intentionally try to get out of it, you cannot get out of it. It is always there. It yeah. is always will be there. And this is what the mystery of Christ we start to see is like. You can't get out of the sun. Mm. The sun is always there. It's always inviting and it's always warm. Mm. Would you agree with that? Sure. So the reconciling work of God, we find in the uh, uh, in Christ Jesus and the incarnation is not only a mystery, but it's Catholic in that the whole human race lives inside of it. Mm-hmm. It's something that's active that is now, and you don't earn its presence. Its presence is there like the sun. Right, right. And this is where he sort of leads the conversation. Uh, it's this irrevocable... Marriage, right, right, uh, between God and His creation. Uh huh. You want to finish off the comments there? Yeah, no, that's that's good because you know what we, you know, it's what they expected God to be, and what He actually revealed Himself to be was so categorically different for them, and maybe we just need to sit back and ask. Is God working in a way that is so different than the way I'm thinking? And it's always what you find is that as you begin to pursue this Jesus revealed in Scripture, he never becomes smaller. He always becomes ever bigger and bigger. And I think this is what this is the profound thought we're going to leave you with today. It's the last sentence that, mm. that he says. He says, you don't have to work for the relationship of Christ because you've got it already. Think about that. Just trust Jesus and open your eyes. Mm. If he's like the sun, it's always there. Mm-hmm. Because of what he's done, because of what God has done. Right. He is there. He's always there. So now we just have to our eyes need to our lives need to be awakened. Our heart needs to be awakened. And this is the point of the mystery of Christ and the mystery of forgiveness without forgiveness to wrap the whole chapter up. We can't awaken to the warmth of the sun. We can't awaken to the reality of the finished work of Christ that is already there. We can't see it. We can't experience it. Right. Remember, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say this and we'll, we'll leave it. I yep. know this is going to be controversial. What I'm sorry, right. but he, it wouldn't Nic- be you if it's not controversial. <laughs> Nicodemus comes and says, <laughs> What must, or uh, we know Jesus that you're this special Mm. teacher, but he says, but we can't figure out what you're doing. Mm. And Jesus says, unless a man be born again, you Mm. cannot see Mm -hmm. the kingdom of God. Right. You can't see what's happening. You can't see the work that's in front of you. You can't experience it. You can't live into it. You can't work into it. Right. You can't do any of these things. You you have to be awakened into the work of God that's before you and the invitation and the feast of salvation that is set before you. Right, right. You have to be invited and you have to receive that. Otherwise, you're just looking at it and go, I know it's something, but I don't know what that thing is like Nicodemus. Mm-hmm. So... You don't have to work for this relationship because you've got it right. already. This is the good news. All right. We're going to leave it at that. We're going to go on to Dan next week. <laughs> and is it next week? Or are we well, gonna we'll be skip a-, a week for Thanksgiving. We're so. going to skip a week for Thanksgiving. So you're going to hear another sermon by old John. And oh, we'll, boy. we'll throw that out there for next week. And then we're going to come back and do... Five and six with yep. Dan. I have no idea what's coming. Dan the man. Dan the man. But hey, everyone, we want to thank you for listening. We want to hear your thoughts. Go to the Facebook group and at Inference Swap and join it and get some discussion going. We want to hear your thoughts on this. I want to, If you have the Podbean app, which is just a podcasting app, you can literally like have discussion with us, and we want to begin to have this discussion. But tell me this isn't good news that Capen's getting into. Tell me that this isn't profound. We would love to hear your thoughts. I know Chris would love to hear them. And we want to thank you for listening. So reach out to us at Inference Swap or reach out, reach out to us at www.inferenceswap.com or, the, or any 
or the Podbean app, especially where you can hear from us. If you can't, how about YouTube? We're there too. Uh, probably after Christmas, we might start doing some live stuff. Oh, I gotta start losing some weight. Yeah, me too, dude. I gotta get on the after Christmas diet because I, I want to start now. It's not gonna happen. It's not, I say it's gonna happen. It'll start Monday. Yeah. It always starts Monday. Yes, you know, what I mean, it's like those Christmas cookies are gonna kill me. Uh, you know, for our one church, you know, like just to see how we do it for our one church thing this week, we're doing wings giving, and there's gonna be a hot wing contest. I'm trying to talk my man Chris into getting oh, involved. No. I'm gonna blow out. You want to blow out some of that gut? Oh. There's some hot, spicy wings coming. Anyway, we'll shut up. Hey, subscribe to us. Share with us. We want to know your thoughts and share this podcast. We love you guys. We will see you next week.